This is Kevin Jones uh, with the FITA Museum at the Fashion Institute of Design and Merchandising. And uh, welcome to our next edition of Collection Conversation. And I'm actually not in my living room, <laughs> as I have been for all of my other uh, collection conversations, but I'm actually coming live from Barbara Bundy's office at our campus today. And I'm very excited um, to be joined by Henry Wilkinson all the way from England. Oh, and here is Henry now. Let me call him up to join. He is going to be joining us in, just in a second. We have lots and lots of questions that have come in this past week. Um, thank you very much, everybody, who uh, sent in uh, questions, because honestly, I don't have to come up with any of the questions of my own. Hello, Henry. Hello, hello. How are you? I'm great, thank you. How are you, Kevin? I'm very well, too. I've so been looking forward to talking to you today, and everybody in our office it's been like, oh, I can't wait for Henry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm so pleased to be here. It's such a pleasure. First, I wanted to say that I'm very sorry to have read the news this morning that Prince Philip passed away. Um, yes. It's very sad. He's been with us our entire lives. And yeah. it's amazing. I was really, really hoping that he would make it to his 100th birthday, which would be in, in two months. But, uh, I know, I know. Yeah, and it's 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 quite strange, really. It's sort of uh, difficult to well, it's as you say, he's been part of the royal family for as long as both you and I have been alive. I assume, so right, right. Yeah. Well, for everybody, uh, because we only have an hour and it goes by so fast, uh, let me just do a real quick introduction with you. This is. Mr. Henry Wilkinson, who is a fashion historian and costume designer, specializing in the work of one of my all-time favorites also, uh, Mr. Hubert de Givenchy, and his collaboration with the ever-so-beautiful, ethereal Audrey Hepburn. Um, as a graduate of the Royal Central School of Speech and Drama in London, he has since advanced his passion for both history and design by working in film and television, excuse me, film and theater, uh, as well as for the fashion house of Givenchy in France. So quite amazing, actually, considering your, your youthful age. Um, <laughs> It's interesting that we were actually talking in the office uh, yesterday uh, in anticipation of being able to talk with you about how much more access there is to archives online, um, just the digital world, going and, you know, you can look at all of the v &A's dress collections. You can go and look at all the Met dress collections, whereas, you know, 30 years ago, it wasn't possible. So... I'm just going to dive right in with all the questions that came in. And one of them is, what drew you to the studies of Givenchy, rather than other of his contemporaries, but also how did you manage to become so knowledgeable about all things Givenchy? Hmm. It's a good question. It's difficult, I think, to pinpoint what it is exactly about Givenchy that for me, I just love so much. Um, I think, you know, as with anything in, in fashion and the arts in general, sort of personal preference is all completely subjective. But for me personally, Givenchy's style and aesthetic and his creations just fit mine so perfectly. And I think it's ultimately, when you look at his work, it's the combination of simplicity, of elegance, um, of architectural cut. He, he really did have a, a flair for architecture when it came to, to his creations. And finally, the whimsy. He would always, always add this touch of, of whimsy, a quirkiness to his designs, whether it's a sort of a, a unique print or an extravagant hat. You know, it's sort of, he always kept this very youthful and fun approach to to style, especially when he was sort of at the peak of his fame. And so that's what drew me to him initially, and that's going back over 10 years. I was 
around 11 when I think I discovered his work for the first time. And I think in the second part of the question, how did I come to know so much? Uh, again, that's difficult to answer because I wish there was sort of a definitive Givenchy resource that I could reference everyone to, but unfortunately there isn't. So it's just been, it really started out just as a hobby. I just wanted to find out more about about this person and, and the pieces that he created. And since then, it sort of just developed and, and it comes from, as you say, looking through archives, be it textile archives or newspaper archives, uh, talking to those who knew him, uh, studying his work in person, holding them in your hands and being able to see how they were created. It's been sort of quite a very gradual evolution to to be able to know sort of the amount that I do about him. Um, there, it, have, um, does the company, because, you know, the company's still in business, does it maintain an archive that is accessible to researchers? Um, it does maintain an archive, and that's where I, I worked in 2019. Okay. Um, it's still sort of establishing its archive officially. So um, I don't know whether people are able to uh, go in for research purposes. I th think at the moment you're not able to because this, they, when I was there, it was still sort of cataloging a lot of the pieces. Mm -hmm. But um, hopefully, maybe in the future, that, that there can be that resource for people, which would be, which would be wonderful. The, um is there a permanent gallery in Paris that shows his work? I mean, I've seen photos online, but I've, I've not been to wherever this place was. And I, I wasn't quite certain if it was kind of like the, the Balenciaga Museum in Spain, um, if there was an equipment or, or the Saint Laurent, you know, you can go to the two Saint Laurent yeah. galleries. If there is something like that permanent for Givenchy's work. There's not, unfortunately. As you say, there is there is Balenciaga, there is the Saint Laurent Museum in 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 France, but there is no permanent uh, Givenchy museum or exhibition. There's been uh, several retrospective exhibitions in The Hague and in Madrid and in New York and LA, um, but none of them permanent. So maybe I should put that on my list of goals to finally establish a permanent. Don't you think? Easy. I mean, it'd be marvelous. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, well, um, we, we got to keep moving on. Um, have you, Did you ever get to meet Mr. Givenchy? I know that you were in communication with him, but did you, in, did you ever get to meet him? I uh, met him, I was say in air quotes, because it was through letters. He, I had the opportunity to send him a letter through a mutual friend when I was 19 and you know that for me was just that was just going to be it I just wanted to be able to express my admiration for him and thank him for his work but uh, a few weeks later he wrote me a letter back and he sent me some of his sketches that he thought I would like and then the following month I was able to see him in person at the opening of a Givenchy retrospective exhibition in The Hague. Um, but unfortunately, as he was the man of the moment and everyone was there to see him, I wasn't able to uh, to sit down and chat with him as much as I would love to that. But, uh, you know, I was able to make that sort of connection with him, which for me was just so wonderful and so great. I had a very similar connection. Uh, Christina Johnson, who's the associate curator, she and I did a project with Betsy Bloomingdale, and we'll talk a little bit of Betsy's Givenchy's. Mm -hmm. We then did, a couple of years later, um, an exhibition called Fabulous, and it was all about kind of a new acquisition exhibition, uh, pieces in our collection, and we did a catalog. And thanks to Mrs. Bloomingdale, Monsieur Givenchy, and I know this is going to be backwards for everybody, he wrote our preface to the catalog and signed, and Christina and I were in Paris, and we went to his house in his the, the famous living room and in the, up the stairs and so forth, and we were there with his dog, oh. and he was in the next room, literally like in this room, let's say, right? And we had an appointed time to meet him, but he had just come out of his bath. 
and he was still in his bathrobe. And so his assistant went in and was talking, and we could hear Mr. Givenchy talking, but because he was in his bathrobe, he didn't want to come out and meet us. And I was like, there's a door. There's Mr. Givenchy over right there. And so literally we got that close to, to so close. meeting him. But it was nice that he signed our catalog, or didn't yeah. have this for us. Oh, I love that. That's a great story. Yeah. <laughs> so you and I both, we've met him, yeah. but we would like to have met him. But not before. quite. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, do you have, and I know the answer to this, but do you have, this mm. one of the questions, for, um, any new additions to your Givenchy collection? Yes. <laughs> yes, I do. Um, and... You know, my, I say collection sort of in loose terms. I think that has connotations of sort of like a museum collection with right. lots of pieces, maybe a warehouse to keep them. Um, I think I have sort of like a curated small number of pieces. Uh, but I have recently, in fact, just in the last two days, been gifted the most amazing dress by uh, a lovely friend of mine who I hope might be watching. It's a vintage seller called Hall of Wonders and uh, it's Mel from Hall of Wonders and she has gifted me this dress it's a boutique dress from his very very early career he established his fashion house in 1952 and I believe this dress is circa 1953-54 and it's so wonderful because I think I wish I had it with me to show you but I don't um, it's so I think if people looked at it, they wouldn't immediately think it was a Givenchy because he's so closely associated with simplicity and sort of purity of line. Um, but I think what a lot of people forget is that in his very early career, he really was sort of finding his feet and establishing his own style and aesthetic. He had just finished working for Scaparelli before opening his own fashion house. And so for the first two or three collections, he he would include these wonderful, unique, and really quite wacky prints. So he'd have the classic Givenchy style, and then these really bold graphic prints. And this dress is an amazing example of that. It's the typical Givenchy bateau neckline, sleeveless, cinched in at the waist with a belt with an accenting button and this lovely full skirt. But then if you look closely, it's printed all over with these huge orange fish and it is so ah. wonderful i love it so much and it's so quirky and uh it's definitely a, a gem in my in my collection now to have that sort of symbol of his very early career do you know who did the the fabric and that print it's a very good question actually um and the majority of his very early uh, prints, so it's spring 1953, he presented this collection, this incredible collection, where all these pieces were printed with motifs of fruits and vegetables. So there was peas, there was oranges, there was pineapples. Yep, there was lemons. <laughs> there we go. And um, it's so, so great. Tomatoes, oysters he did grapes and a lot of those prints were by um, Madame Brossin de Meret who was a textile artist a really important and influential textile artist and she worked for, for Dior and, and Givenchy yep there's the, the pea prints it's so great um, and so quirky and I think my my best guess at the moment would be that this fish print would be by uh, Madame Rossin de Meret. So I, I I believe there is a, a big archive of, of samples of her work in Paris. So I, sh I shall try and get in touch and see if they they have any reference to that. It would be great to know who the artist was. Do you, I know this is going to be backwards, Henry, and I can send this to you. I can email this to you. Have you ever seen this book? No, I, I came across that book the other day, but I've never read it. I saw it at the bookstore at the DNA the last time I was in London. 
And you know, I was flipping through it, I'm like, oh, this is amazing. And then seriously, there are pages about that, those textiles, and these are all Givenchy designs, the garments. Amazing. It is absolutely oh, incredible. I couldn't yeah. believe it. And I thought, I got to show Henry if he's never seen this, especially yeah. because you mentioned the, the, the fish. And I thought, I wonder if it's connected to these fantastic designs, you know, when he did the lemons and, and grapes yeah. and so forth. So, um, yeah, yeah I, it's in Italian. Uh, mm. And a lot of these are in a, pri in a private collection. So right. I'll send you this information so, so you can get a copy of the book. Yes, absolutely. That'd be great. Good. Uh, because those are some of my all-time favorite Givenchy designs. I just, I just love that whimsy uh, that he did, uh, especially those that are in the early days. It was really fun. Yeah, love uh, it. So, do you have a favorite Givenchy design? And part two of the question uh, is: Do you think you're ever going to write write a book on Givenchy because of all the information mm -hmm. you're gathering? Um, I, it, I can't choose a favorite design. I do have a favorite collection, which maybe is a sufficient answer. Um, but my favorite collection is his Autumn Winter 1962. And that for me is so brilliant because it, it incorporated this beautiful tailoring. There were these incredible suits and coats and, um, if anyone knows the film Charade, starring Audrey Hepburn and Cary Grant, um, she I've wears seen it many times. Too many times to count. <laughs> um, all her clothes from that film came from that collection. So that's just a little glimpse into into the work that he made for that season. Um, and he had these beautiful evening dresses, which were both classic Givenchy style, sort of simple with beautiful embroidery. But then he also sprinkled in these amazingly architectural pieces with these really unique shapes. Um, so I love that collection. That's my, my favorite one, I think, although it, it could change, but I think that's my favorite. Um, and in terms of writing a book, that is definitely something I hope will be on the horizon sometime in the future. I think partly because it, again, goes back to there was never this definitive resource for me when I wanted to learn more about Givenchy. There are, there are great books out there, one of which is sort of his official biography, which is a wonderful, wonderful book. Um, it, is, it is all in French, so again, that's not necessarily made for the uh, English or American market. Right. And there have been other books printed, uh, like the Givenchy style, but... Um, majority of them are out of print now and have been for many years and they're so, incredibly expensive if you find them yeah they're collect yeah they're really collector's items now yeah so um there's there's not necessarily a uh, an accessible reference uh, a book for people to to read so that's definitely something i've got on my uh my agenda that i've uh, been working working on in my mind right you know and it's it, as it, we're we're obviously object people you know it's the garments that really and the accessories that really excite us and it's it's it would be wonderful to see a book where it's all about the clothes um i mean i yeah. love period sources and you know all of that but it's like to really be able to see the garments and especially to talk about the season to season to season and how it, it changed, how we kept classic designs that went on for years, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. That is something that I'd love to see. Please do that, Henry. We would all love it. I will. <laughs> I will. <laughs> That's my mission now, okay. Yeah, and you know, the FITA Museum is here to help you in any way. Of course, we want you to come and visit, and we'll pull out yeah. every single Givenchy, and you can spend as long as you like with all of them. <laughs> Perfect. I'll get on a plane as soon as I can. Yeah, absolutely. So, okay. Um, now, talking about Givenchy, um, I, I find this a very interesting question. Have you found a construction feature in his mm. work that is unique from others, or did Givenchy fit within the general milieu of how the couture works? Um, that's a very good question, actually. He did sort of 
every piece he created was always finished to the traditional couture standard. Um, but he, I have noticed he had certain uh, preferences in terms of construction and finishing techniques that, um, you know, I don't want to say he was the only designer that did them, but it was certainly his preference that other designers didn't do. Uh, so, for example, when uh, in the 50s, when his pieces were boned or structured, uh, traditionally, designers like Christian Dior would use uh, cotton bobinette for the corselets, the bone bodices to go underneath the dresses for support, really quite structured. Balenciaga in the 60s would use uh, a grow grain fabric, again, really quite stiff and structured uh, for support. But uh, Givenchy tended to use a synthetic uh, taffeta, which I find really interesting from a construction point of view because you would perhaps not think that that would be structured enough to, to maintain the shape. But it really is. It, it has enough sort of structural integrity to it. And I think part of the reason he chose to use that is because it was so comfortable against the skin. It's not sort of, I think, grow grain and bobinette and those kind of stiff fabrics that were traditionally used could really be potentially quite uncomfortable after a while. Mm -hmm. um, but this sort of, he, or, Givenchy always used this really quite soft synthetic taffeta. Um, and another wonderful thing that he did that, uh, again, was he used throughout his career was he loved for his pieces to be flat lined with silk or ganza. Um, because he said it gave them tenue, which is French for sort of the body, for, for structure. It gave them uh, that sort of extra support. That, the buoyancy in a yes. Yeah, which I think was that one of the secrets behind the beautiful shape and, and uh, sort of fluid structure, that sort of juxtaposition. But there is such a thing that that I, I think is, has connotations with his work. I think that was one of, the, one of the secrets of his construction. And also, you know, something like an organza, it's very, very light, even though it, it's got a body. So but when the woman was moving, it would not restrict the air filling her garments, you know, and yes. he had those very beautiful lines that would only be accentuated in movement, and especially with the airflow going through them. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, Com and sort of comfort and wearability was such a motive for Givenchy in his designs. You know, his very, his very famous quote is, uh, the dress must follow the line of the woman, the woman must not follow the line of the dress, not the other way around, which um, was, I think, really a big part of his success is that obviously Dior was famous for his beautiful silhouettes, but they did require... Uh, that sort of small waist and heavily boned garments with yards and yards of tour petticoats and horsehair braid. And I think Givenchy, along with, with a few other designers from that, that particular period of time, took a different approach and, and went for comfort instead. Perfect segue. Um, I know it's backwards, but this is a uh, catalog that we did for the Bethany Bloomingdale exhibition, which was in 2009. And we also did a documentary um, working with her. And um, one of my all-time favorite Givenchy's that she has donated is this organza example. Literally, the outside um, and inside is two different weights of organza. It is absolutely stunning. And you can see how it just skimmed her body. And she mm -hmm. only ever bought garments that were very comfortable in, in her couture. She was not into the really cinched waist and so forth. It was, you know, that aspect of, of being very comfortable and Givenchy yeah. did her aesthetic perfectly. Absolutely. Yeah. And she was she was such an important client of his and they did have this great relationship, those two. I have this detail shot of the workmanship of the dress. And what's amazing is that these these are strips that are done on the bias and then applied on the bias. So they literally spiral around her body. And I know it looks like they're all evenly placed here, but they're actually all slightly off compared to where it fit on her body. It's amazing. Wow. So then when she's wearing it, it looks perfectly even. 
I mean, yeah. that's an incredible thought, it, obviously by Monsieur himself, but also the, the petit man, the, 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 the seamstress yeah. that we're working Absolutely. with. Absolutely. The wonderful workers. Yeah. It's just sort of that's, I think, really Givenchy's work ethos encapsulated. It's, a, it's designs that look incredibly simple and effortless, but then behind that there is these genius construction techniques which really made them so important. And something that he obviously learned a great deal working with the other couturiers before establishing his own house. Um, because, as you know, takes an incredible amount of study in order to be able to do, and also, like you said, to appear very simple. Yeah, absolutely. He, he employed this wonderful team of, of, uh, of seamstresses and tailors, including uh, Philippe Venet, the, the wonderful oh, wow. designer who started out uh, at Scaparelli, and that's where he and Givenchy met. And then Philippe went to work with Givenchy as his head tailor for 10 years before establishing his own fashion house and leading this very su successful career. So it was these incredibly talented people. I have another one that is actually mm -hmm. more that was Betsy's. This is yes. one of my favorites as well. Yes. And Betsy was actually um, our founding donor for the museum um, in 1977, and we became a nonprofit foundation open to the world in 1978. So she started right at the very beginning in believing in us and donating Givenchy Couture. Wonderful pieces. And that's, this dress that you're showing now was such a, an important and popular piece from, uh, from this collection. And you see a few examples of it still clearly. It was, again, I think this is another example of Givenchy's use of classic design. This is sort of a little black dress, but then he just completely adds that touch of bonkersness <laughs> with these feathers. It's so wonderful. It's so unique. Yeah. And what's amazing also about this, and, and um, Kara Austin, Bloomingdale's, yes, the... Bloomingdale's department store, Betsy Bloomingdale. Um, in 2013, we had a letter that was sent to us from the, the Fashion Museum in Madrid. And they were working on a uh, exhibition about Mr. Givenchy and they wanted to borrow the feather dress. And I just came across, so here's this letter. And I don't know why we never loaned. I'm not certain if the exhibition actually happened. Uh, but right. Monsieur Givenchy drew the feather dress on the letter. For reference, I suppose. I, I think so. So, so. that we would know what feather dress they were talking about in our collection. That's so great. I mean, isn't that charming? Um, Love it. Because whenever I think of Monsieur Givenchy and, 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 and see when he was um, interacting with the people, he was always so elegant and so gracious and so kind and, and very thoughtful to, to you know, the, the, the things that he would do. And I thought that was so lovely. Yeah. And of course, we love that we have this now in the, in the museum's um, special collections. Um, so let's move on to another of our favorite person connected with Givenchy. Why do you think Monsieur and Audrey Hepburn worked so well together and what made their collaboration and their friendship literally last for decades and influence all the rest of us in the world. It's, it's a really important question actually, because it's so, it's such a unique relationship that they had in, in a, to an extent that I don't, think there are any other collaborations that are completely comparable. There were, there was of course Yves Saint Laurent and Catherine Deneuve mm -hmm. who worked together and you know, Marlene Dietrich and Dior worked together, but the Audrey Hepburn and Givenchy have almost been become linked together in, in a way that's inextricable, you know. It's when you think of Givenchy and his designs, you think of Audrey Hepburn wearing them and 
when you think of Audrey Hepburn, obviously they all they both did so much more in their career outside of each other, uh, including her incredible charity work for UNICEF. But when you think of Audrey, you think of her maybe in a little black dress or in a Givenchy design. And I think part of that comes from the fact that they both met in their very, very early career. They met in July 1953. Audrey Hepburn had just finished filming on her first big starring role in Roman Holiday, for which she would later win an Oscar. Givenchy uh, had just debuted his third ever collection, again, to great success. But um, they met right at the, at the start of their careers. And I think they just found that they shared this same approach to style and to, and to clothing. And they, I think the reason that their successful collaboration lasted so long is that it wasn't just a, a sort of work collaboration. It wasn't just a fashion designer making clothes for an actress. They were genuinely best friends and he was the executor of her will in later life. And they just shared this mutual, I think, adoration of each other. And I think that's, that's really the reason that they continued to work together and be so successful and influential, both in their personal and professional careers, because there was this genuine love there, which I, I, I genuinely struggle to think of a similar kind of collaboration, which makes it so unique. It's wonderful when you find almost, you know, your soul that you can be with for your entire career, your entire life, your family life, you know, and obviously they found it. This is actually my favorite photo. Um, Joanna went through our Michelle Arno photography archive and found a number of images of Monsieur with, with Audrey Hepburn. And this was my favorite because to me it just absolutely shows that love and affection um, after all, so many, you know, decades. Um, yeah. You know, and the saddest thing, of course, is that she passed away so soon um, and so long he had to live without her. And that must have been very difficult for him. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, you know, I, I don't think it's necessarily connected per se, but Audrey Hepburn passed away in 1993. And Givenchy retired from designing in 1995. And, you know, that's not to say that it was because Audrey was no longer there. I think, you know, obviously there were many reasons behind it. But it is sort of quite symbolic in a way that, that his designs sort of stopped after that, after, after she passed away. Mm -hmm. And they were just, they were just so closely connected throughout both of their entire careers and, and lives. Um, why did Givenchy, uh, I'm going to change the subject now, um, because we had a really cute question come in. Um, why did Givenchy design so many fabrics with pineapple prints and embellishments? This is not a question I would ever come up with. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I love how, how specific it is. Um, but I think, well, that does really come from Givenchy's love of prints that he perhaps formed during his time with Jacques Fat and that's Schiaparelli. And it, there's a really interesting Schiaparelli design from 1951, which was at the time that Givenchy was working for her as a designer. And it's this sort of white organza dress with embroidered pineapples all over it. And then again in 1953, after he'd established his own fashion house, he designed at least three pieces I found which have pineapples on them. And I don't think it was, I don't think it was a specific love of pineapples per se, but it was just this wonderful, quirky print that, and, and motif that he used. And again, it goes back to that spring summer 1953 collection, which has all these uh, food motifs, these right. these produce motifs, um, and yeah, I think that that has that it's a part of his career that a lot of people forget about or overlook. But it's it's so great to see these these really 
whimsical pieces. Whimsy, I think, is a great word to to describe his, his I style. I do too. I often wondered if it had anything to do with literally welcome, you know, welcoming his clients or welcoming the press or welcoming because you know pi the pineapple is a is a very old symbol, often especially in colonial architecture here in in the eastern seaboard of the United States. Over the front door is often a pineapple, and it was a symbol right. of welcome. And I just wondered if, it, you know, for him, there was any sort of connection with that, or it was just something fun, quirky, and as you say, whimsical. <laughs> I'd love to know. I think, yeah, I mean, my my immediate assumption was that it was just this kind of youthful thing. It's sort of the something very quite literally fresh and, and exciting about about these designs and they felt so summery and right. they felt incredibly young for that time and it was really flipping uh, the what they saw as couture at the time again obviously he was a huge pioneer of, of separates and, and blurring those lines between couture and ready to wear um, but I wonder if it does have any any further connotations. Well, and you know, a pineapple is just juicy and tasty and you want to bite into it. Exactly. Just like, exactly. you know, I want to bite into his couture. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, okay. Um, one of, I've got lots more photos to show and for everybody watching, um, Henry sent us an entire PowerPoint presentation of his research into our collection, which we thank you very much because you have spotlighted and dated some pieces just, you know, perfectly. And that you, I, I, so Kristen, are you available for other people to, to research for? Because you did this for us and, and we thank you for it. But, you know, you are a professional. It is part of your living ability. Do you also do this for uh, people or other institutions? Yes, I do. Um, mainly Givenchy related research. Um, but yes, I've sort of worked with uh, museum uh, uh, private clients who have their own personal collection, um, vintage sellers who want to date a piece of Givenchy that they wanted to sell, for example, auction houses. Um, yeah, I've sort of been able to establish this this research service for, for anyone wanting to know more about Givenchy and his pieces and his the pieces he created between 1952 and 1995 during his entire tenure I'm able to do research. It's great you are the go-to man uh, and, and that is fantastic so everybody go to Henry. Um, so I, I want to briefly talk because I do have all these other in images to, to show but um, you had kind of an extraordinary situation happen with you that a lot of people know about because it's been um, published, I mean, fantastic. And for anybody who doesn't know, Henry also uh, does um, Instagram posts that are really, or excuse me, YouTube posts that are really wonderful that dig into different aspects of Givenchy's oeuvre, his work. And um, one of those that came about because of, of, of COVID, perhaps, uh, is the famous now Leah Razabel gown that you have in your private collection, which would have literally probably had it not been for you, never been discovered of what it actually is and its importance. Can you tell us a little bit about that whole situation for you? Yeah, absolutely. So that was a piece that I came across. It was at the start of the very first COVID lockdown here in, in the UK. And um, obviously industries were closed and I was sort of looking for a project. And um, I came across this bodice, this Givenchy beaded bodice on online for sale. And it was in such bad condition, but the beadwork was so beautiful and something about it just really intrigued me. And I, and I, you know, these kind of pieces are getting uh, rarer as time goes on. And so I wanted to restore it to how Givenchy would have originally intended, as sort of a, a symbol of his, his design and his career. 
And so I, I acquired the piece and the seller told me that there was supposedly a Jackie Kennedy connection to the dress, uh, which I didn't take too seriously at the time, in all honesty, um, because without concrete provenance or anything like that, it can be difficult to, right. to read too much into those kind of associations. Yeah. Um, but I, so I got the dress and I, I started researching it and it was really interesting because it was such a beautiful piece and had everything I look for in a Givenchy in terms of authenticity and it had this incredible beadwork but unfortunately, there was only about four inches left of the skirt. It had all been cut off at some point. Out. So, <laughs> I know. <laughs> so, it really hurt my heart. Yeah. Um, but I wanted to, so I just wanted to restore it. And to do that, I needed to do research, try and find out perhaps what it would have looked like originally. And um, I got in touch with a couple of friends from the archives and a friend who has some archive images as well of Givenchy collections. And there was no reference to this dress in any of the collections whatsoever, which was actually one of the biggest indicators to me that this piece was important because it meant that as it was an authentic Givenchy, it meant that if it didn't come from a collection, it was exclusively designed for a client, for one person, which is only something he did for very important clients, mm -hmm. including Jackie Kennedy and, and Audrey Hepburn. And so that really piqued my interest. And through months of research and sort of sharing that research online as well, finally led to the discovery of photos of Lee Radziwill, Jackie Kennedy's sister, wearing the dress. And that's sort of when the research just blew open for me and I found photographs and video footage of her, of her wearing the dress. I, th was... I think even from Los Angeles, I heard the scream <laughs> by you when you first saw the picture of <laughs> me wearing it. I, I think it was almost Absolutely. like a sonic boom. <laughs> Worldwide, it was. Yeah. I couldn't believe it. It was definitely one of the a, a massive pinch me moment, in because it meant that the the connection was true, and it wasn't just a piece that I found important because it was a symbol of Givenchy's work. Right. It meant that it was a piece that was historically important and socially and culturally important because, you know fitting on a, on a day like today with the passing of Prince Philip. It's a dress that she wore to meet Prince Philip and Queen Elizabeth at Buckingham Palace, um, which was just one of the occasions to which she wore it. So really was a, an important, important piece. Well, congratulations. Um, you know, those, those types of uh, situations are the dream moments that, that collectors, curators were, were all looking for. And, you know, if you, if you do your homework, you do your due diligence, you keep looking, you know, you too, I'm talking everybody else out in the world, you know, can find something that you can make important again, just like you did, Henry, with this piece. And um, I look forward, hopefully, someday to being able to see it in person, um, uh, because just online, it's, it's very, very beautiful. Yeah. Well, thank you for, for that and for, for kind of sharing some of that with us. Um, of course. Now that that project is, is completed, what's your mm. next project? Um, next project, well, with the, the new acquisition of, of this wonderful fish print address, there is some restoration work that needs to be done on that. Um, so I hope that I can help to to bring that back to life a little bit and restore some of that damage um so that's i think my next project i also have made a promise on social media that i will recreate the uh the pink Givenchy dress worn by audrey Hepburn and breakfast at tiffany's so that is on my on my to-do list absolutely i I need to fulfill that obligation as well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's another project in the works. Um, 
Did you? Because I, I know that you recreated the black, the white gown with the black lace overlay from Sabrina. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. You know that act, the, the actual real dress d did survive. It, it does survive. Yes. Okay. Because it, it was came part of the, the Reynolds collection. Right. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to show off some of the things that we have in the museum's collection and also share with the information that Henry has so kindly um, sent to us about some of these pieces. So we can just run through them. There's a lot of really fun things. Um, we have a collection of croquis, which are the, the line drawings that a couture house sends out to its clients or, or did before videos were sent out. And I'm not certain what's done today. Uh, and these came from Betsy Bloomingdale to us. And as you can see that they had their fabric swatches, but they weren't colored in or anything. And Henry finally found the, the matching historical photos uh, for those pieces. So thank you, Henry. My pleasure. Um, and I want to say that Henry himself is also a fantastic illustrator. I really love your, your drawings so much. Oh, thank you. They have an elegance and a fluidity and a simplicity that really resonates nicely with, with what I think of as Givenchy clothing. So um, I think he's been influencing you since birth. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the ultimate compliment, I think. <laughs> um, and there are a couple of other pieces that we have in the museum's collection that Henry found the period photo. But what I find interesting is the aspect of the difference of the, the, the shapes and the, I guess the customization that happened. So can you tell us a, a little bit about that idea of customization of, of, of the personal client versus the couture runway model? Yeah, well, I think that was sort of, um the idea behind haute couture at the time, sort of not just exclusively for Givenchy, was that um, it was custom made for the client, which meant that to a certain extent, I will say to a certain extent, the client could um, suggest their personal preferences if they wanted to change maybe the neckline or um, maybe have the fabric in a different color. They could express those, those preferences always as long as it didn't compromise the designer's vision some designers were very uh sort of scrupulous about the fact that it couldn't uh it couldn't negate their their original vision so this is a great example of that is that the black and white photograph is how it was presented on the runway and then the client's version on the left there was clearly they saw the dress and loved the print um but wanted something a little bit different so they chose the sort of one shoulder and in order to be able to express their, their personal preferences. And, and another example here is that the, the suit to the right is a jacket and skirt, again, part of the Bitter Museum's collection. But as it was presented on the runway, it was a trouser suit, a pantsuit. So um, clients were able to, to express their personal preferences if they if they wanted to. It's interesting because like with Betsy Bloomingdale, she told Christina and me that only once did she ever suggest a change to one of the designs. And she was so unhappy with her decision to do that, that that was the only time she ever did it. And otherwise she always went with the designer's vision and she was just very careful about what she chose. She knew what would work on her body, her lifestyle, the thing, perfect personal preferences. And I thought that was a very unique situation that a client learned that often it's best to go with the vision of that master designer. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So um, when we were going through the collection, um, Joanna pointed out to me that honestly, and I, I have failed, I have only acquired two small Givenchy items for the museum's collection. Now we had pieces here before I was a curator and we've had other pieces donated that I wanna show. But um, 
Henry actually is the one who found the images of, of these absolutely fantastic cats. Um, the first one that I acquired was this absolutely charming little straw. I don't know, we call it a bebe. Um, it's not really like a, a pillbox or a, a toque, but it is absolutely wonderful with these double little bows and this kind of stepped appearance to the front. And Henry, in his archive, has a period photo of, and I'm not certain which model this might be, wearing the actual um, little hat. And here it is. I was thrilled to, to death, Henry, when you sent this, because this is just fantastic. And it's the type of research that can take hours and hours and months and months and years and years and you might never find anything. Um, and so where did you find this? Do you remember? That, I think, uh, oh, I can't remember where I found that image. I think, um, you know, I've gone through many, many newspaper archives and things like that. Um, I can't remember which newspaper that is from, but, um, I can try and find out the publication for you as yeah. well. But we know it's, it's now 1955. So, I mean, it's yeah. fantastic to actually have, you know, the full date of the hat. Because I think I dated it like 57 to 62. But it's great mm -hmm. now to have that actual date. Yes. Which means that it was the same, uh, it would be the same collection as the red hat with the, with the veil. But there it is. Amazing so, red hat. This is the only other Givenchy I've ever purchased. We got it from a dealer here in LA. I actually thought it was in his private collection. And he says, well, don't you want to buy this? And I was like, oh, I didn't know it was available. And I, of course. Um, and I have it too high up on the mannequin head because actually it sat back. Um, and one of the ways I got to know Henry is because you posted this photo on Instagram, and this is your Instagram account with the photo, and I screamed when I saw this. <laughs> um, and here is the fashion show in 1955 with the, the mannequin, the model, wearing this hat with these incredibly long veils coming off. And um, uh, Mel Ferrer and Audrey Hepburn in the fa at watching the fashion show, and literally they're both staring at the hat. At the hat. And it's interesting to note that the dress that she's wearing with the hat, Audrey purchased. So she clearly loved that outfit. And I, I wonder if she had the hat as well, who knows? Yeah, exactly. Um, do you know what happened to the, the dress that she bought? Is it in a collection? I don't know, unfortunately. I have not seen it resurface since. Um, she loved it and she wore it for a couple of years, but after that, sort of disappeared. So I, I wish, well, hopefully maybe we can try and find it one day, but that it's such be a beautiful one. Yeah. And just for everybody to know, the dress was pink with this lovely red hat. Yes. Uh, so and so, I love, I love that thing. there you go. Absolutely yeah. marvelous. So for me, this is the kind of dream stuff, uh, you know, to find these really amazing pieces. And kind of like you, I'm also, I, I just love his really early uh, work, especially because it's not around um, as much anymore. So when we were able to find it, not even not a full gown, but even one of his accessories is is very very exciting. Yeah. So absolutely. Um, let me, oh, I've got one other here that is a really interesting matchup. And um, this kind of came out of the blue for, for us. It is this coat here. Yes. Wool coat. And Henry, what date do you think this might be from? Well, I haven't been able to research this one fully, but from what I've been able to see, I'd say circa 1959. It's got this sort of, and one of the, the telling details is this sort of double row of top stitching all around, which he loved doing in, in that year and the year prior and following. And 
I just love that coat. I think it's so beautiful. That shawl collar, the sort of sailor cut at the back. Yeah. Huge, huge sailor yeah. collar in the back. Yeah. So brilliant. You know, one of my philosophies is you never turn down a donor call because you never know what might be at the end of that call. And uh, a lady called me. I'd never met her before. She invited Christina and me over to her house. She, she lived here, lives here in Los Angeles. And she happened to be the niece of Kay Thompson. And for those of you who know Kay Thompson, um, she has quite a connection with Givenchy, obviously, but also Audrey Hepburn. The one thing I want to say is when we went over to the house to, to view these pieces, and she had some Balenciaga, she had some Mr. John clothing, not just Mr. John hats, and also Givenchy, she donated this, uh, and she did not know who the designer was because the label is not in the neck at all. There, it appears to have no label. So it was maybe she thought maybe Balenciaga or whatever. Well, I got it back to the office and I was examining it. And lo and behold, the label is indeed there, but it is inside the right hand pocket. Have you ever oh. seen that before? Never. Literally, I because you know, we always oh, dig into the pockets to see if people left things or you know, we found some pretty grody things in pockets. But I flipped the pocket back and literally right at that seam area, just just right there, um, is the Givenchy label. And I had never seen a Givenchy label anywhere but kind of the back neckline or maybe the side seam of a garment, right? Yeah. So, hey, Henry and everybody else, make sure you look inside the pockets now. Check because here, and it has never been touched this absolutely is the, the the niece did not even know it was there i love that and i love that um there's actually a sort of great connection with kate thompson and, and Givenchy, um in that perhaps her most remembered film role is in funny face from 1957 and um i remember reading a story many years ago um, which said that Kay Thompson, whose clothes for the film were designed by Edith Head, was supposedly jealous of Audrey Hepburn, who got to wear these beautiful Givenchy couture creations in the film. And so as the story goes, they were shooting exterior scenes in Paris on location and were met with unexpected rainfall and Kay supposedly went to the Givenchy boutique and bought a coat, which is the one she's wearing in the picture. Now, I like, I, I like that story. I personally am not sure how true that is, right. simply because from a, you know, a design perspective, looking at her outfit in the film, this particular outfit, it's all very perfectly coordinated. The coat perfectly matches the skirt. and It all looks very intentional. Um, so it's a nice story, but what I think it is certainly safe and true to assume is that this film, and particularly Audrey, was her introduction to Givenchy's work. And I didn't know that um, pieces of Givenchy that Kay had worn was, still existed. So it's great to know that your museum collection has, has this coat that belonged to her and was potentially inspired by the clothes that she saw Audrey wearing in the film. Exactly. And of course, Kay Thompson was in Funny Face, basically representing the, the real live photo uh, editor, um, Deanna Freeland. And yeah. uh, Fred Astaire really was kind of embodying the photographer, Richard Avedon. And then of course, you know, Givenchy is playing her marvelous um, self. And what's fun is that, you know, here is a photo of the actual Dion of Reland. Here is uh, Richard Avedon. And of course, this mm -hmm. is the very famous model, Dovima, who was also um, in Funny Face uh, herself. <laughs> so we have this really just sudden, suddenly fantastic connection, you know, with this yeah. one random donor call that we received that ended up with this very beautiful coat. 
With the label in the pocket. With the label in the pocket, it's great. exactly. It's the story behind that coat. Well, Henry, no kidding. The hour is up. Uh, it it Gosh. goes by in a flash. I, I, I'm sorry to say that we're going to have to say goodbye to you. But I want to say a tremendous thanks to you for taking time out of your busy schedule. And I know it's the evening time in uh, London now. And we appreciate you joining us today for this collection conversation that has been so wonderfully anticipated. And you are such a delightful person. And I'm so excited that you love what you love and that you're doing what you're doing because, um, you know, Think of you 20, 30 years from now, what you're going to know and have seen and have done and contributed. And that is a fantastic thing. And thank you for being a small part uh, today of the FITA Museum. I've just enjoyed this so much. No, so have I. Thank you so much for, for inviting me. I could talk about Givenchy for more than an hour. Exactly. But um, it's been such a pleasure and I'm so delighted that you have such a wonderful collection of the museum. and preserving all these these great pieces and this legacy, which makes me very happy. Well, you the same also. And, um, you know, truly, it's an open invitation. We want you to come out and, and we're just going to have an entire day of Givenchy and not have to limit it to only an hour. So. Yes, please. Sounds great. So thank you, everybody, <laughs> for joining today. We will see you in two weeks from today at 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time for our next collection conversation. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye.